Good morning and welcome to the service today. If you would stand with me and praise him. passage today I'll read to you. Um, you don't need to turn there necessarily. It's in 1 Samuel chapter 7. I'll read verses 2 through 3. And God's word says, And it came to pass, while the ark abode in Kir Gerald Jotha, Rim, that the time was long, for it was twenty years, and all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. And Samuel spake and unto all the house of Israel, saying, If ye do return unto the Lord with all your hearts, then put away the strange gods and Ashtaroth from among you, and prepare your hearts unto the Lord, and serve him only. He will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. Let's look to the Lord. Lord, I do praise you that you are such an awesome, magnificent God. You're everything that we need. Lord, as the song said, you, you took our burden upon you. You suffered and bled and died. But it didn't end there, Lord, because you were raised again in newness of life, Lord, and you provided salvation to all those who are willing to accept you. A love that we can't, I can't even begin to understand that you showed toward us and the tremendous sacrifice. I pray, Lord, that this world and ourselves would not take that for granted. Help us to remember to be thankful and to praise you daily, Lord, for what you've brought us out from and the promise and the hope that you've given us through eternal life of what, uh, what life will be in the future, Lord. That this is the worst it's ever going to be for us on this earth, that when we're with you, all the pain and suffering, all the physical traumas, Lord, will be gone. And that it'll just be to walk with you and to have fellowship continually with you with no afflictions and no sorrows. So, Lord, may we encourage ourselves through your word, through the assembling of ourselves here together today, 
through the encouragement of trying to uh, reach out to those who can't be with us. Lord, help us to uh, bring the body of Christ together as one body. And some of the people are the different parts, Lord, and they can't be here. Pray that they would, uh, that we would continue to lift them up to you, and that they would, uh, as, as you draw them back, Lord, we'll be able to come back and to, to be in fellowship safely with us as well. Lord, I do thank you for the good results that uh, Dan mentioned in Sunday school and the, the praise of how uh, Jessica's surgery went and the optimism the doctors have. Uh, and just uh, praise you for that outcome, Lord, as uh, Dan was very encouraged. And just pray, Lord, that you would continue to give them the results uh, of the healing that you're doing in her life. Lord, we do pray for the Brigadois at this time and the, and the passing of Brenda's father. Uh, Lord, this is a void that only you can fill. And you are the Heavenly Father, and may you comfort the family. May you strengthen them. And Lord, may you just provide everything that uh, this world can't to comfort and, and encourage them. Help them to know we love them and that they're in our prayers. Lord, we do pray for this church today that you would help us to listen to what Pastor has to say, that you've laid on his heart, that it would be the, what we need this week uh, to face the challenges that you have before us. And praise, Lord, that you'll bring us through. In your name we pray. Amen. Uh, you may be seated. God is good, eh? Amen. Hey man, I love that. Um, been on my heart for a while. I've been I've, the blessing uh, uh, back in uh, May asked to be the faith coach out at uh, Bailiff Gym. And while out there, a couple folks came up and said, could we have a Bible study? Would love to do that. And uh, tried to integrate it here. We have so many good career young adults that are attending the church. And folks, uh, I just entered my 50th year. I turned 49 on Jan 1. I'm still a young adult, just so you know. But it's time to start passing the mantle. And so we have, so this Wednesday at 6.30, you don't have to be parents. You have to be career adults. I hate to put an age on it because, I mean, 50, 49. <laughs> 49, I'm a pup. Let me tell you, I am still a pup. But uh, we're going to meet back here. We're going to study character. And we'll study characters in the Bible. You do not need a study guide. Uh, if you're dropping your kids off, what a perfect time. You don't have to go anywhere. Just stop off. I encourage you to invite people outside the church. This is where it started. And then looking at the at the career adults and the younger adults that are, are really building up in our congregation, I think it, it'll be fun. We're going to start in the book of Ruth, and you will find no better character qualities than Ruth, uh, Naomi, and Boaz. I just want to share this with you from Titus so that you'll be encouraged and you'll pray on it. And if you aren't coming, if you feel like you're an older adult uh, and you want to pray for us, that'd be great. From Titus 2, like Teach what is in, in according with sound doctrine. Teach the older men to be temperate character, worthy of respect, self-controlled, and sound in faith, in love, and endurance. Teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanders, addicted to much wine, but teach what is good. Then they can train younger women to love, to be self-controlled and pure, be busy at home, to be kind. Encourage the young men to be self-controlled and everything set them an example by doing what is good and teaching your integrity, seriousness, soundness of speech, and not to be, cannot be condemned. We're going to work on character back there. It's a Bible study, a lot of discussion. Wednesday night at 6.30, back, in the, back here, I encourage you all to come. Uh, Stacy and I will be helping me out. She'll keep me on uh, par, but uh, I appreciate the opportunity and praise God. If you would stand with us at this time, we're going to sing some worship songs. What gift of grace is Jesus, my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy. 
righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace.
Amen. That's beautiful singing, isn't it? I love the music at this church. I would like to ask you to please turn to 1 Samuel chapter 7. I'm holding here in my hand a card from one of our missionaries. We took them on recently for support. This was a couple that was with us a couple of Sunday nights ago. And this little picture inside is of the three girls that were here that evening. These are the Howders, and they're preparing to go to Bangladesh. Can you imagine that? I think he's 28 years old, Bangladesh, to work in the very hospital where Dale and Jody helped to get that up and running. But it just says, Merry Christmas, Bible Fellowship. It was such a blessing to be, with, to be able to be with you all on the 13th. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to share our calling to Bangladesh. God has used you to encourage us greatly, and it goes on to say some other things, but uh, so thankful for the wonderful missionaries that this church is able to support. And uh, I want to thank you for praying for us. Uh, first of all, I want to thank those who, uh, Mike Walton and others who stood in my place last week. I appreciate so much to hearing the good news of how things went so well last week. But I want to thank you for praying for us. My little holiday started like this, and then it continued to grow like that. And then by the time it was over with, it ended up like this. Uh, we made a couple of trips up to Michigan, and we were down in uh, Chattanooga, and while we were playing board game with my mother-in-law, our children came up from Atlanta. They had put a bid in on a house, and while we were playing that game, which I was losing, of course, so I'm glad they got the phone call, but they learned that they were new homeowners, so of course they wanted us to go see the new home, and so we made another trip down to Atlanta. And every time I go to Atlanta or Detroit, I want to come back to one place <laughs> so I can get some rest in Arlington. <laughs> I love Arlington. 
And was there anything else? Oh, yes. Uh, this is very important to many of you. I'm just going to say what you're thinking, so go Bucks for most of you, okay? <laughs> just get that out of the way, and let's look at folk, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 7. I watched the first quarter of it. Again, I can't stay up real late when they start those games late like that, but my wife encouraged me to stay up. I said, honey, I'd like to, but I just can't. Next morning, she said, you should have stayed up and watched that one. <laughs> <laughs> and from the sounds of things, it sounds like some football coach made a wrong mistake in labeling us number 11, right? So that always uh, is not good when you do something like that. I think that's all the, uh, by way of advertisements, now let's look at uh, what's really important here. It's been working on me. First Samuel chapter 7 has been working on me. You know, because as a pastor, you want to know, uh, where do you want people to look in 2021? Where do you want to go in 2021? And so, just so you'll know, I'm, I'm considering doing a series of uh, presentations on leadership. And what a place to come to for leadership, First Samuel, because you're at the end of the judges, 450-year span of judges. Uh, Samuel was the last judge. And you're at the beginning of the kings. And what I'm finding over here in First Samuel is that there are three types of leaders. Self-appointed, man-appointed, and God appointed. So that's just to whet your appetite. That's kind of the direction I feel like the Lord have us go. Leadership is so essential in this day and time, is it not? Matter of fact, you know what? Wherever I slice the scriptures these days, I find it very interesting that in Samuel's day, he lived about a thousand years before the coming of Christ. So that's 3,000 years ago. But the conditions were very similar to the conditions in which we live. If I pick up tomorrow morning's newspaper, guess what? It reminds me of 1 Samuel, if I know and understand 1 Samuel. And this whole chapter evolves around verse 12. So let's look at verse 12. Then Samuel took a stone and set it between Mizpah and Shen. And some of these places, you probably have no idea where they're at. I'll just put you on notice. This Kirjath Jerim that is mentioned in verse 3. Kirjath Jerim. Do you see it in verse 3? That's kind of like if you're in Arlington, it'd be like Liberty Benton High School, right about in that area, northwest of Jerusalem. And Mizpah is like where the Hancock County um, courthouse is, downtown Finley, Ohio. We're going to see Mizpah in just a minute. Where was I? Verse 12. Then Samuel took a stone, set it between Mizpah and Shen, so that's just north of Jerusalem. And he called the name of it Ebenezer. Ever sang that hymn? Here I raise my Ebenezer. And you can, if I turn around and look, people look at each other and say, do you know what that means? No, but it's good. Let's just go on and sing the rest of it, you know. You know what Ebenezer means? It was a stone of remembrance. And I thought, how appropriate, because we're about to come to a table down here in the front, if you can't read it from where you're sitting, carved in wood in this table, says this do in remembrance. And these people had gotten themselves into a real jam because they forgot to remember how big and how wonderful, how awesome God is. Now, does that sound like any nation you know? As a matter of fact, look back with me at verse 2. It came to pass while the ark abode in kirjath Jerim, that the time was long, for it was 20 years. And all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. Of course they're lamenting. That, that's a strong word, by the way. That's a word you would use in a funeral home. People are beginning to wake up and realize just how far we have drifted from God. Have you made that conclusion yet as a nation? We have drifted from God and we are suffering the consequences as a result. And the best thing we could do as a nation this morning, the best thing you could do as an individual, the best thing we could do as a church is to come to a table and remember how big God is. Kind of like the Navajo Indian who lived on a reservation Dirt poor, little crops, little cattle, little sheep. But they came out to his neck of the woods and they discovered there was oil on the reservation. He's the Indian chief. 
And when there's oil on your reservation, you get rich quick. He would walk down to the bank, all discouraged, all depressed. He'd tell the bank manager, he said, the cattle are gone, the sheep have died, and the crops have failed. And the branch manager knew just what to do. He led him back in the back of the bank into the vault. He put a little chair down there, sat the Indian chief down, opened up some of those vaults and began to pull out his resources and just dangle it in front of him. He had a great big smile on his face, and when he left, he said, all the cattle are well, all the sheep are well, and all the crops are well. He just needed to be reminded of how many resources he had. And if you're a believer here this morning, I don't know about you, when I read the front page of tomorrow's paper, it looks very depressing, very discouraging. But when I come into God's house and they're having communion service, one of the things that's supposed to happen in my heart, I remember I get this vision up in heaven of just how big my God is. And Samuel knew the importance of that, and so he put a stone up after they won the battle and said, I don't ever want you to forget this. I don't ever want you to forget how big your God is because otherwise you'll be doing what America is doing this morning. We've turned our back on Almighty God. So Samuel, verse 3 says, He spake unto all the house of Israel. And I want you to notice this carefully. If you have your Bibles, look at the if and the then. You do your part, God will do his part. If you do return unto the Lord with all your hearts, then put away the strange gods and Ashtaroth from among you and prepare your hearts unto the Lord and serve him only. Notice, if you do your part, God will do his part. He will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. You know what? That principle still holds true today. If we're willing to do our part, See, they, they've wandered so far away from God. It led to terrible consequences. And Samuel's job was to bring them back to a place of remembrance. When you open this chapter of Scripture, what you have to understand is that just 20 years ago, right in that very spot, a place called kirjath Jerim, Israel lost a decisive battle. Have you been reading the newspaper lately? There's a lot of saber rattling going on in the Middle East as I speak. In fact, from Minot, North Dakota, we sent our bombers over to the Middle East just to let folks know we're still here. They've moved the aircraft carrier out of that part of the world because, uh, what is it, today is what the, an the anniversary of the killing of the top general in Iran, and they're, they're concerned that there may be some attacks in the Middle East as I speak. As I open this passage of Scripture, there's a lot of saber rattling going on. Israel lost a decisive battle, and 30,000 Israelis died in the battle. That, that's nothing to take a, a shake a stick at, right? 30,000 people died as a result of them grabbing the Ark of the Covenant, thinking it was a lucky charm. We can do that as Christians sometimes, right? Wear a little cross around our neck that's meaningless, thinking that if I wear that cross, God's got to protect me somehow. Sometimes people put something on their dashboard of their car, thinking if I've just got that on my dashboard, I can't get in an accident or whatever, I can't get a speeding ticket. And so they used the Ark of the Covenant as a lucky charm, and they were slaughtered. The Ark was gone. They were a disgrace to their neighbors. And what's worse than that, as you read this passage of Scripture, they're serving idols. This uh, word in verse, is it four that I read? Verse three, Ashtaroth. If you look down in verse four, both Ashtaroth and Balaam are mentioned. Balaam. Balaam was the male God, the God of the sun. The origins of Islam come from that word. Who they worship, at least, their God. Muhammad, Allah, I should say, excuse me. Ashtaroth is the female counterpart. And without getting into detail, both of these gods 
caused the children of Israel to engage in extreme filthiness and wicked immorality. They had borrowed these idols from the Philistines, which were just west of the Israelis. And they took them as their gods, and they felt very comfortable with them. Twenty years, the ark had returned back to Israel, but Israel had not returned back to God. Of course, as I'm reading this, one of the questions that I had about it is, where's Samuel in all this? Remember Samuel? Did you read the first part of the book? He was a man who was born of prayer. His mother wanted a child. And she went down to the house of God and prayed and prayed and prayed. In fact, she prayed that one person thought she was drunk. She said, I'm not drunk. I'm praying. I know what I'm doing. I'm praying for a child that I can give him back to God. And Samuel was taken down to the temple, and he grew up there under Eli's tutelage. And so do the math. He's got to be in his 20s, right? It's been 20 years. And the question is, where is Samuel in all this? And there's not a doubt in my mind that Samuel was doing what God had called him to do. He was preaching to the people who would listen to what he had to say. And even like in our own culture, you go out and peddle the gospel of Jesus Christ nowadays, it's like a farmer who puts his plows on the back of a solid rock. It's like somebody takes a battering ram and keeps ramming the door and it doesn't budge. But you know, if you keep plowing long enough, if you keep battering that door long enough, something begins to give way. And that's where we're at in this passage of Scripture. The children of Israel, notice verse 2, they are lamenting, not after Samuel. What does your Bible say? They're beginning to lament after the Lord. And Samuel is going to strike while the iron is hot. It's his job, Samuel's job, and there's parents in this room this morning. It's your job to do what Samuel did. Talk about leadership. To bring your people under your sphere of influence back to the place where we remember how great God is. That's what this passage is all about in a nutshell. How do you get people back to the place of remembrance Samuel did what every effective leader should do, whether you're a mom or dad, grandmom and granddad, whether you're a KYB worker, trustee, deacon, elder, pastor of Bible Fellowship Church. Give the people decisive steps, black and white steps. That's what we're going to see in just a moment. Here is what we need to do, regardless of what's happening in Washington this week. This is what we need to be about as individuals and as a church. We need to get back to God. We need to get back to the place of remembrance so that at the end of the chapter, he raises that stone and says, let's never forget. Let's not go through this this all again. Let's remember how great our God really is. So here's what I've been thinking while I've been on my holiday vacation. Samuel leads these people to do three decisive things. And number one, he says, let's get the shovel out. Let's clean up our sin. Look with me, please, at verse, uh, and I read this for you, but I'm reading it again for emphasis sake. Verse three, after they're lamenting in verse two, they're grieving like you would in a funeral home after the death of a loved one, at least I did with my parents when they passed away. Samuel strikes while it's hot in verse 3, and he speaks to the house of Israel. He says, now look, let's take advantage of your lamenting here. He says, if you'll return to the Lord with all your heart, here's what you do. Put away strange gods. Did you know that's the purpose of communion? 1 Corinthians 11 says we're to examine ourselves. And it says, be careful when you do that, because if you approach this table unworthily, There are some in your midst, he says, who are sickly, some who are weak, and some who are no longer with you because they approach this table in a half-hearted manner. And Samuel says, I want you to look at your heart this morning. And I want to ask you to ask yourself this. Is there any God that you've set up in your heart 
that you've grown accustomed to and you're not even aware of it, but it keeps you back from entering into a solid, full-hearted relationship with the Lord. So I begin to think, what are some of the idols that we have nowadays? And I couldn't help but think of the word pride. I think even in this climate, this culture in which we live, we talk about quarantining. And we can get ourselves in a position where we just lock ourselves down in our living rooms and we don't need anybody. We don't even need the local church and we don't even need God. It's a dangerous environment to get yourself into. I just read a quick essay. I want to ask the Lord, Lord, help me understand. What is it? What is pride? I stumbled across the essay by John Newton. And he put his finger on specific symptoms of pride in the life of a believer, which I thought was very interesting. If I'm going to be serious about dealing with pride and self-sufficiency in my life, John Newton said that part of pride is when I go around looking at the problems in other people's lives. Is this something maybe you developed in your life that you're not even aware that you do it? If I'm not careful, I can criticize with the best of them. Believe me, I was trained to do that. I can come into a local church and I can find more problems with Bible fellowship than you can. I guarantee you that. My list can be a lot longer than yours. But I don't come to Bible fellowship church to look for the problems. Years ago, I determined in my heart I'm coming to be part of the solution. You can either be part of the problem, part of the solution. And I've determined years ago I'm, I'm coming to the local church. I know it's got problems. But I'm coming to give my all in the service of Jesus Christ because I want to be part of the solution. But fault finding, he said, was one of them. A harsh spirit. Isn't it interesting? We can be so hard on other people and we don't take that same spirit and look in the mirror. I just found this interesting. What, what's pride? What, what were you talking about? That I can set up an idol of pride. Well, he says superficiality. Come to church, go through the motions, fool people publicly but go home and live like a rascal listen the person I need to treat the best in life is my wife sitting here or my children if they were here and so if you want to deal with pride look in the mirror this morning are you defensive if someone tries to get close enough to you and point out maybe something in your life that could be corrected do you throw up a wall of defense People, he said, who are desperate for attention. People who, like on the road to Jericho, both the pastor and the assistant pastor had other things going on. They didn't have time to stop and get involved in the life of a man who needed their help. So pride is one of them. Put away the strange God. Self-sufficiency is another idol we can set up in our lives. But would you look at the text? The text says that they had these personal idols of Balaam and Ashtaroth, which were filthy. And another way of saying they were caught up, like our society is caught up in immorality. How are we doing on our mobile devices? Are we looking at things we should not be looking at? How in the world could you come to a clean, pure table like this this morning if you're not willing to deal with that sort of activity? Now Samuel, under the leadership of God, says it's my job to call Israel back to where they need to be, and it starts by cleaning up sin in our lives. Putting away strange gods. The second thing he says here you need to do, and I'm not making this up, look at the text. He says you need to, number two, prepare your hearts unto the Lord. How do I do that? Well, if you take a long trip, you don't just get in your car and head in that direction. You make preparation for that trip. If I'm over here involved in sinful activity, which I shouldn't be engaged in as a child of God, and I want to get to where I need to be, I need to make preparation. I need to be willing to confess my sin. And turn from that activity so that I can begin to live a life that's pleasing to the Lord. 1 John 1.9, as I come to the communion table this morning, says, 
if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to do his part, to forgive us of our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's what it means to prepare your heart to seek the Lord. But there was one more. Under the good hand of God, Samuel led these, place, these people back to the place where they needed to be. And the third thing he said you knew, need to do is to serve him only. Now, that's where God wants me to be. Instead of wrapped up in myself and sinful activities of the world, the flesh, the devil. I need to concentrate completely. 24-7, 365, my conscious waking hours of serving God and serving God alone. That's where true satisfaction is found. If you want purpose and true joy in life, it's right there in the center of doing the will of God. And Samuel knew that. And Samuel, Samuel now has an audience of people who are just crying tears. They want to get back to the place where they need to be. Don't know how, so how do they do it? He gives them these three steps. Now, for years and years, I have read lots of Charles Haddon Spurgeon sermons. And I found it interesting that from time to time, when he gets at this level, he loves this little poem here. And so I thought I would share it with you. Because I read it recently in one of his sermons. The dearest idols I have known, whatever those idols might be, help me to rip them, tear them from my heart so that I can worship only thee. Pretty good, isn't it? It was at the end of the 19th century when Charles Haddon Spurgeon had one of the greatest ministries in all of Ling uh, London, England. They called him the Prince of Preachers. He also went on to say this, Repentance is to leave the sins we loved before and to show that we in earnest grieve by doing them no more. I mean, it's not enough to come down here and cry great big tears at the altar, which is a good thing to do, by the way. But if in my heart I'm prepared to go back home and to live as I've always lived, what's the sense of that? We have got to turn, prepare our hearts, and serve him and him alone. So that's step number one. How do we get back to where we need to be? How do we be effective as a church, as a nation once again? Clean up our sins. But the second step here that he seems to transition into verses 5 through 11, he talks a great deal about prayer. And as your pastor, I want to challenge you, if you've never done it, to commit to greater praying in 2021. There's something to this. It's one of those things you can't put your finger on it, put it in a bottle and measure it, but I've got to tell you something. I'm here today as a result of a mother who was praying for me. And a few other people, a youth pastor, pastor and his wife. I'm here today as a direct result of their prayers. I know that without a shadow of a doubt. And I want you to consider how God might want to use you to make intercessory prayer on behalf of someone else. That's all Samuel does here in verses 5 through 11. Let's have a look at it. Samuel said, after he's told him how to repent and get back to God and serving him alone. He says, he says gather all Israel up to the courthouse in Finley. I'm just giving you... A location that you can identify with. Seven miles, eight miles north, okay? Let's all go up there for the purpose of crying out to God in prayer. So look at what the Bible says in verse 5. He says, I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to make intercessory prayer on your behalf. So they gathered together to Mizpah, verse 6. And they drew water and poured it out before the Lord. Now that's interesting, isn't it? Water was a very precious commodity in this environment. And to take a pail of water and fill it up with water and just pour it out before the Lord is kind of like saying, Lord, this is very important to me. It's very special. It's very necessary for me. Water. But I love you more. And I'm just going to give it to you as an offering, as a sacrifice. Kind of like when we get together as a church to pray. Do we live in a busy environment? You better believe it. Everybody's busy. I know that. I get that. But there's something about when the church says, hey, we're going to take a time out and we're going to gather together for a specific purpose of praying for this ministry. There's nothing like it, folks. And that's all in the world that uh, Samuel was calling these people to do. Let's go up here for a prayer meeting. So they drew water. They poured it out before the Lord. Look at other signs here of, of, of the genuineness of their praying. They fasted that day. And they said... 
we have sinned against the Lord. Good thing to do, isn't it? To be able to acknowledge as a church, as an individual, as a nation, we turned our back on God. We've wandered far away from, we've gotten our place, ourselves over into this condition. And we need to be way over here serving the Lord to Him only. So they pour the water out. They make confession. Notice they also accept Samuel's judgeship. You know, he was a prophet. He was a judge. He was a type of Christ. And they said, we're going to line up under your leadership, Samuel. He's a type of Christ. That's what prayer meeting is all about, lining yourself under the good hand of God. We want your kingdom to come, your will to be done on earth as it's currently being done up in heaven. He judged the children of Israel in Mizpah. Now watch what happens, verse 7. When they go up there for a prayer meeting, they've got a target on their back. Anytime you get yourself in a fix, in a condition where you are in the center of the will of God, just remember... You've got a target on your back. And verse 7 says, The Philistines heard that the children of Israel were gathered together up in Mizpah. And again, if you look on a map, they're over in the Pandora area. That's where the children of Israel reside, along the coast of Israel, the Mediterranean coast. There was Ashkelon, Ashdod. There was Gath. There were five major Philistine cities. And now they hear that God's people have gotten right with God. They're over here. And, and they think they're declaring war on the enemy, on the Philistines. So watch what they do. They gather together to Mizpah. The lords of the Philistines went up against Israel. And when the children of Israel heard it, they were frightened. They were afraid of the Philistines. And the children of Israel said to Samuel, don't stop crying out to God for us. So he'll save us out of the hand of the Philistines. And Samuel took a sucking lamb and offered it as a burnt offering, holy unto the Lord. And Samuel cried to the Lord for Israel, and the Lord heard Samuel. And Samuel, as he's offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines draw near to battle against Israel. But, the strongest conjunction in our English language, but the Lord thundered with a great thunder on that day upon the Philistines, and he discomfited, in the King James it says discomfited, it means he confused them, he crushed them, he destroyed them. And they were smitten. Is prayer powerful? You better believe it. We are called not to fight in, with flesh and blood, but our fight is against principalities and powers and the rulers of the darkness of this world. Samuel took the people up to Mizpah. He prayed for them in faith. I am going to pray to the Lord for you. That's called faith. When push came to shove, there was a crisis. They cried out to Samuel. They said, don't stop praying for us. And he says, I'm going to ask God to do what he said he's going to do all along. That's called hope. Then he goes and grabs a sucking lamb. And he offers it as a sacrifice, and God thunders from heaven and defeats the host of the enemy. And I'm telling you, if we want to be successful as a church in 2021, if we want to be successful as individuals, we need to realize the battle belongs to the Lord. And we come together and seek his face. As Samuel took these people up north, and they sought God's faith, and he just hauled off and worked a miracle, the likes of which they would never forget. But just in case they are tempted to forget, you know what Samuel did? Samuel says, now what we need to do is we need to set up a special stone. Clean up our sin. Look up to the Savior. But in verse 12, he settles the deal. He says, then Samuel took a stone, it says in verse 12, and he sets it bef between Mizpah and Shin. Those two places aren't very far apart. But he sets the stone up there, and he called the name of it Stone of Help, a memorial stone of God's helping his people, past, present, and future. Are there any mile markers in your life that you can point to and say, I know God's going to help me now because God helped me back here and God helped me over here. 
We've got a few mile markers along the church here. If you walk into the main entrance, probably where you came in this morning, just to your left, it says something about Bible Fellowship Church 1973. Someone had a vision. Can God pull off that vision? Have a look around you. Did pretty good, didn't he? Then they had a bigger vision. Well, we need a school. So you walk down the middle door. It says something about Bible Fellowship Church 1978. It was a bigger vision. If you go down to the fellowship hall, there's a little stone out there that says something about Bible Fellowship Church 2012. If you look through those windows this morning, you can see God's not finished with the vision. And I believe God wants to do greater and greater and greater and even greater things here at Bible Fellowship Church. But we're going to have to do it God's way. I was riding with my wife down from Chattanooga to Atlanta and back. and I didn't ask her, but I got to tell you what was going through my mind. I've been down this road umpteen dozen times. And the first few times I was on that road, Ho Chi Minh Trail, right? I-75, north and south. I was on a Greyhound bus. I was just an 18-year-old scared to death. I didn't know anything about college. I didn't know there was a place in northwest Ohio called Arlington, Ohio. I was a little scared teenager on that bus crying out to God, help me, guide me the next step. I need you, Lord. And here we are 40 years later. It's unbelievable what God has done in my life. And I could point to person after person after person who was an Ebenezer stone for me. God brought them into my life. And when I think about them, they are mile markers. God has done in your past, he can do in your present, and he can do even more in your future. That's what an Ebenezer stone is all about. Here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I've come. And I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Remember that? Do you have an Ebenezer stone this morning? It simply means that what God's done for us in the past, he can do it in the present. They can do it in the future. But we've got to do it his way. Got to turn from my sin. Clean up the sin. Look up to the Savior. And set up stones of remembrance. Do you have any stones? Maybe you need to put up a marker this morning. God brought me through 2020, right? That's a great deal. That's a big deal. But let me tell you something even bigger. There was a lady by the name of Gladys Aylward. who served in southern China for many, 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 many years as an orf at, at an orphanage. One day, the Japanese decided to invade that part of the world, and she had a hundred orphans in her charge. With one other worker, they left that facility, they ran over the mountains with the orphans. And one day, she didn't think they were going to make it out alive. And you could see the despondency rose up in her countenance, and some of the children were concerned. And a 14-year-old girl came beside her and said, Mrs. Awal, you remember all those stories, those Bible stories you used to tell us, like Moses leading the people out of the promised land, or out of the, uh, Egypt into the promised land? And she looked at that 14-year-old and she said, of course I remember that story, but I'm not Moses. And that 14-year-old said to her, yes, but you serve the same God that Moses served. And you read your Bible, you know when Moses got across the Red Sea, what did he do? He broke out in song. Joshua got across, what was it, the Jordan River. They put 12 stones as a memorial. And throughout the Bible, people who had God break through and do the unbelievable, the unthinkable, always were about setting up stones of remembrance so their children and their grandchildren could point to them and say, guess what? We serve a mighty God. And no matter what you're going to be going through in 2021, you serve the same God, Moses, Abraham, Joshua, David, Paul, and Silas. And glad to say a word. What he's done for others, he can do the same for you. So, Father, thank you for this uh, precious truth as we start the new year this morning. I thank you for what you've done for us as a church right here in Arlington, Ohio, before our very eyes. It's unbelievable. But we are positioned, Lord, and I believe 
that you want to do so much more through us in this coming year. So help us not to focus on government, on the things going on around us, but Lord, help our focus to be on Jesus Christ and to realize and remember that the God who could take care of his people successfully in the Old Testament is still in business. Now, if you're here this morning and you've never repented of your sin, never turned from it, that's called repentance, and put your faith in Jesus Christ and him alone, this would be a great time to do just that. And you can watch God do in your life what he's done for countless of others in their lives. Won't you give your life to him this morning in salvation? If you're a father and God's touched your heart, I want to be a better leader for my family. Maybe before we come to the communion table this morning, God has spoken to you about something. It would be good to come to the altar. Just get along with the Lord and ask him to help you to properly prepare for this communion service. Lord, do a great work in this invitation. We love you. We acknowledge your greatness and ask that you'd please come and do it all over again just to show the world how powerful you are working through weak, insignificant people, creatures like us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together and sing that famous hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Come thou fount of every blessing, to my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet, sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mountain I'm fixed upon it, mount of thy redeeming love. Here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I've come, and I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger wandering from the fold of God. He to rescue me from danger interposed his precious blood. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy grace now, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Thank you. You may be seated. I'd like to ask the deacons if they would to come now and assist me.